Hi, this is Paul. On Twitter, someone posted this piece written by Father John Bear. Now, I think probably anybody who's at all familiar with, even at a very low level with orthodoxy, will recognize Father John Bear's name. He is the Regis Professor of Humanity at the University of Aberdeen. He's a very, he's a very well-known American orthodox scholar. He has a piece written in Public Orthodoxy. Part of, the re part of the reason I bring these kind of things to my channel and then I read the comments is because you all out there know, some of you out there know this world far better than I can. And so I learn a lot from you in the comment section, which is why I read the comment section. I uh, found this on Twitter. And he begins talking about, obviously, the, uh, the Russian-Ukraine conflict. In recent days, several articles have appeared on this site, raising profound, difficult, and unsettling questions. Um, so, uh, seems, uh, SR, senior, that's what I think it is. Um, Vasa bravely asks whether heresy is a charge that can be applied to the edict of the of the 25th All-World Council of Russian People approved under the chairmanship of Patriarch Kirill of Moscow on March 27, 2024, concluding rightly that it does indeed express in the words of St. Basil about heresy a clear difference in the very faith of God. Now, it's interesting because on Twitter there's a, there's a video going around by some evangelical pastor basically hammering down how Basically, Christians should stay out of politics and you know, politics and religion. Here we go. And, of course, there's, there's, there's one particular food fight in American politics and religion, which has a certain shape, and all of this talk about Christian nationalism, et cetera, et cetera. Well, here we have uh, the Russian-Ukrainian edition. Moreover, Senior Vasa, I'm just going to senior because I don't know what it, I don't know what, I'm sure it means something. Like I say, I I'm unschooled with respect to the Orthodox. I'm learning as I'm going. Pointed to the the uh, provision of the 15th canon of the Council of Constantinople in 861 that those who separate themselves from communion with their primate because of some heresy condemned by the Holy Councils or Fathers when he preaches when he preaches heresy publicly and preaches it openly in the church are not only subject to the penalties prescribed by the rules but are also known to the honor befitting um, but are also worthy of the honor befitting the Orthodox, for they condemn not bishops, but pseudo-bishops and pseudo-teachers, and did not by schism cut off the unity of the church, but attempted to preserve the church from schisms and divisions. In other words, uh, schism is, is what the heretics do, and we preserve when we stay. Now, of course, I, I, I had a conversation with a, with a, with a lovely man that... Um, that it's in no wait no ads it'll come out soon um he's he's a crc uh gentleman from uh rocky mountain house alberta and he contacted me and had particular things he wanted to talk about with respect to the christian form church and so i thought we had a lovely conversation he expressed his mind on all of this and well differences <laughs> differences abound always have so Father Bear is taking this stuff head on. Um, he's talking about war crimes. He's talking about this uh, patriarch in Moscow. Um, and then he gets into the, the meat of the article. In this dire situation, perhaps the most pressing question to be asked is that of the satirist juvenile who guards the guardians. This is indeed a question that we must allow to pierce the bubble of any form of ecclesiology that idealizes or idolizes any position or privilege, that treats the current structure as if it is the eternal reality of the kingdom of God, rather than being there to serve the function of and to be subservient to proclaiming the word of God. And I can, now I'm not trying to dunk or do anything like that, but I, when I read a lot of this, I thought, this sounds tremendously Protestant to me. Now, maybe I'm just being foolish. I'm not. But what I see here is engaging in all of the realities that we are dealing with today with respect to structures and trying to figure out what the church is. I'll, I'll continue reading. The, the whole article really sort of caught me by surprise. 
And this is no mere theoretical questioning. When real human beings are being sent to give their lives in killing others, all in the name of a holy war, the distortion of the truth, calling black white, it is quite literally devastating, both for the lives of those who are at stake and for what we call, and which is holy, a true abomination of desolation set up in the temple. And he goes on and talks about church fathers, um, and it gets towards, let's see if I can, maybe I'll change some things here. The Episcopate, rightly discerning the word of truth as we pray in the liturgy so that they might fulfill the role rather than because they necessarily do so, has come to hold a privileged place as the guardians of the truth and spokesmen for the church. Indeed, often identified with the church. And again, obviously, there's a great deal of Roman Catholic um, Roman ro questions about this obviously arise in the Protestant Reformation with respect to the Roman Catholic Church. I'll say it that way. Indeed, often identified with the church. Where the bishop is, there is the church. I frequently heard those words quoted to me too often by bishops and attributed to St. Ignatius of Antioch. But this is not what St. Ignatius said. He said rather, where the bishop is, let the people be present just as where Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Universal Church. Smyrna's 8. It is by any standards a mistake to omit Jesus Christ and the people from the equation. Moreover, when St. Ignatius wrote this, the bishop was not in the position we think of the episcopate today. He was a bishop overseer of a particular household community, as the parish priest is today, not the overseer of a diocese. In due time, of course, as the number of particular communities in a geographic region increased, it was necessary to coordinate their activities first in a larger city and in even greater geographical areas. One of the leaders of these communities has entrusted with the task as the first among equals, never the first without equals, of calling together the other leaders of the community to ensure the peaceful and coordinated activity of the church in the area. As this activity grew during the third century, councils began to be held, covering even larger regions and developing a body of canonical legislation to regulate the well-functioning of these structures. And then with the conversion of Constantine and then the empire, whatever in fact that meant, these structures grew not on a scale, grew on a scale never ever imagined before, opening up the possibility of ecumenical and, let us not forget, imperial councils and financial support from the state. All these structures developed for the well-being of the church. Now, it's important to recognize that Constantine and others within their culture, within their worldview, very much looked to the church not simply to bless. Now, when we think about the state way down past the Protestant Reformation, past these, the, the foundation of democracy and the American experiment, we usually sort of imagine the sort of we the people that the, um, that the, that the beginning of the American Constitution, Constitution says, we the people, in order to ensure a more perfect union. It's sort of, again, this mentally, this vision of this body. Now, that is that a political body? What, what kind of body is that? These develop for the well-being of the church, but it is such as we may remember that these are not um, the essay, the being of the church. Even now, as we pray, in other words, the hierarchy, the all of this machinery on top is for the well-being of the church. And so then, of course, you have to ask, well, where is the church? Well, the church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is the people. This little Protestant ditty song that I and, and many of us learned at our youth. Even now, when we pray in the liturgy for the bishop, it is so that he may serve your holy churches in peace. The diocese is not a church, nor is a larger structure. Whether or not we have come to customarily speak of the patriarchate or synod as a church, a phenomenon exacerbated by the rise of nation states and the corollary national churches. During the early 20th century, Orthodox Christians in exile, the proper state of Christian existence in this world, there's so much built into this. And of course, it makes me think of Christian Reformed church structure, how we try to balance these things, how we try to give expression to these things. It's, it's just really fascinating. Ecclesiology is, in many ways, the, 
you know, one of the areas of theology that is so live these days. I'll skip a little further down. We are clearly in a time of transition every bit as momentous as the conversion of Constantine and the empire. Although in a reverse direction, we no longer live in Christendom and are learning once again what it is to be an exile in this world. And again, I, I see, yeah, I, I see all of the forces in the world that provoked so many Protestant structures and so many revisions in the church, in Protestantism, and in fact, revisions in Catholic churches. Again, I won't speak to the Orthodox because I know so little of it, but it's a very, very interesting piece. Such as it would not be surprising to find that the forms and structures developed within prior epochs must also evolve as they did then to ensure that structure once again serves the purpose of its function. And to do this, it is helpful to go back to the period before such structures were developed and then identified with the church in the period of figures such as St. Ignatius and Irenaeus. And behind them, the New Testament, where we find other ways of speaking about the church, not in terms of structure and offices, but as mother, bride, and body. She is our Heavenly Mother, the New Jerusalem, in whose womb we are born into life as we enter into the Paschal Mystery of Christ becoming the body of Christ, and as instantiated in the local community, coming together as the body of Christ. In this world and for the life of the world, she is the bride, united as her body to her head, the one Lord Jesus. But it is vital to note when we speak of the church in such ways, we are not speaking of those structures and bodies that we have become accustomed to calling church. Unless, of course, you're sort of a congregationalist. We must be extremely careful in our usage of words, lest we end up transferring one thing that really belongs to another, and in doing so, abdicate our own responsibility. If we can learn to be precise in our words, however, a vision of the church opens up in which the answer to the question, who speaks for the church, is broader than we might have initially supposed. When we look back to the last century to consider those who spoke for the church, our minds turned to those who had something to say, inspiring others in their words and lives, men and women, lay and ordained, unless we remember in our bubble of self-conceitedness, orthodox and non-orthodox, to whose words and lives continue to inspire us even today in a way that what are thought of as official statements of the church no longer do, if indeed they ever did. And we will at the same time be able to find rest and peace in the hands of God who draw all to himself in ways we cannot yet see, but also speak out on behalf of the church ourselves discerning the word of truth, both for those who have yet to hear and for those who proclaim the position of guards but fail in their guardianship. Wow, what a piece. What a piece. I'll put the link below. I, I I thought it was great. I thought it was great. I mean, this is deep in the the, the Christian Reformed Church's particular quagmire right now as well. So, yeah, let me know what you think.